Good afternoon, guys, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and as the title of the video suggests, I want to take a look at two switchblades today, or automatic knives, um, which pretty much represent sort of the beginning of the modern era of automatic knives and the current state of the industry. And so the two knives I've selected to take a look at are uh, the ubiquitous or what was one at one time the ubiquitous black knife originally developed by uh, uh, Ron Miller of Largo, Florida and Charlie Ox of Ox Forge or Ox Industries. Um, this particular example is a later model made by uh, the former incarnation of Paragon. It's not the same Paragon that's producing automatic knives today, but the earlier company uh, that it replaced. And of course the second knife I want to take a look at is the Gerber 06 Auto. It's probably been issued in larger numbers by the US military than anything from Benchmade or Microtech um, and really represents sort of the standard of the industry today. Uh, it was introduced originally in 2006 as the name implies I'm assuming it's called the Gerber 06 because of the year it was introduced. Gerber is not a name that's generally associated with automatic knives. We generally tend to think of Microtech and Benchmade and some newer companies like Protech, uh, but they have now well over a decade's history making automatic knives and uh, this one's just about as good an automatic knife as you can find for military service. So. I don't want to spend too much time talking. I know I have a tendency to make these intros a little bit too long, so let's move right over to the tabletop. And I know I'm splicing this in in a kind of strange way, but I actually shot the majority of this video before I shot the last video that I posted earlier this week, in which I promised to give a 10 or 15 second update uh, in each subsequent video about the Kershaw slash Emerson CQC 8K. Uh, I have started using it this week. I have been carrying it every day. You can see there's some finished wear on the blade already. And I don't know if you'll be able to make it out. I don't have my regular camera, which is why I'm shooting like this. I'm using my MacBook Pro and the little built-in camera there. But um, you can see where the paint has completely worn off the blade. Uh, you can still see some gray finish underneath. It's not bright, shiny, stainless steel. So I do believe uh, Kershaw is not lying when they say that this is black oxide coated. Again, definitely has an enamel on the top, uh, but where it's worn off, it does look like black oxide underneath. Over the last couple of days, I've cut up some cardboard. Um, I haven't been doing a lot of heavy work with the knife, but uh, just to test it out, I've cut up some cardboard. I've done some very light batoning uh, using pallet wood. Uh, obviously, the liner lock in this knife is not sufficient for doing any serious batoning. Liner locks are generally good for uh, all around general duty, but I would not, I'm, you really shouldn't baton with any folding knife, but I, I did say I was going to put this thing to the test. And uh, so far, I mean, it's only been less than a week, but it, it seems to be holding up fine. So let's get back to the video you came here to see. All right, guys, so here are the two knives in question, and this is not meant to be some sort of head-to-head -head comparison uh, in terms of performance. I've owned this knife for more than a couple of decades, and I've used it pretty much. I've um, done a little bit of damage to it. I've had to make some modifications to it. Uh, this knife, on the other hand, is absolutely brand new. I just uh, got it a couple of days ago. And while I've played around with it a little bit and tried deploying it and looking at it, I haven't had a chance to actually use this knife at all. Um, and I wanted to make this video when it was in brand new condition. I have every intention of using it hard. I didn't buy the Gerber to be some kind of safe queen. Um, it's a rugged use knife and it's going to get used ruggedly and I'm sure it'll appear in future videos. But uh, right now, I want to just kind of do a historical uh, piece because these two knives represent sort of bookends uh, to a story, uh, that story being the uh, evolution or the 
the era of the modern folding knife. Um, this is a Paragon black knife. It's a more or less carbon copy of the original black knife as done by Ron Miller, a custom maker in, in Largo, Florida, and then later Charles Ox, uh, who entered into a sort of loose partnership with uh, Ron Miller in uh, marketing and modifying the original black knife. This is a Paragon uh, made by the now defunct Paragon company. Um, Paragon knives are again in business today. They're making high-end automatics, but that's a completely different company as far as I know. I think they may have purchased the, uh, the name and the logo from the original owners, but uh, it's a completely different entity. Um, this knife was manufactured from, I guess, about the mid-1990s. Uh, to the early 2000s. This is a mid-1990s example. And this knife, the Gerber 06, represents sort of the current state of affairs with uh, military-grade modern automatics. So let's take a look at the Paragon Black Knife first. Um, this knife actually, to me, still looks very modern. I <laughs> I bought this back in the mid-1990s when I was in my mid-20s. And I bought it, A, because there was a lot of um, legend and rumor circulating about this knife. It was purported to have been used by the um, Navy SEALs. And that is slightly true. Um, the original from Ron Miller and Charlie Ox was in fact used by the Navy SEALs in very limited numbers. Um, many more were purchased, private purchase items by military uh, personnel, including a few Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and other sort of elite personnel. Um, and this knife has been used. Uh, it seems to have acquitted itself well in combat arenas in Iraq and uh, presumably in Afghanistan later on. But as I've already pointed out, it uh, more or less represents the very beginning of the age of the modern auto. Uh, automatic knives or switch blades or flick knives, whatever you want to call them, have been around just about as long as there have been folding knives. Um, well, actually, the earliest folding knives probably date back to the uh, late Roman Empire. Um, but the uh, slip joint or friction folding knife that we're still from so familiar with today basically dates from the early 18th century and there were switch blades in the early 18th century but almost all of those uh, employed a sort of flat kicker spring uh, when you would deploy whatever type of switch they had the kicker spring would kind of flick the blade out just a little bit and momentum would carry the blade forward to the fully opened position. And the U.S. military, for instance, used uh, kicker spring type automatics uh, right up through World War II uh, and uh, probably Vietnam even in the form of the Schrade uh, Walden uh, parachutist snipe. That was a kicker spring type auto. But uh, Ron Miller in the late 1980s, I think about 1987, came up with the idea that um, if you had a way of powering the blade fully, I'm gonna kind of restrain the blade here and you're gonna see that this blade powers itself forward through the entire opening stroke until it locks open. And the way it does that, and you'll see in a couple of minutes, I'm gonna cut in some footage of this knife disassembled that I shot about a week or so ago. Uh, it has a coil spring, which is uh, situated around the blade pivot with a little ear or a tab sticking straight up that engages a hole in the blade. Ron Miller's vision was to market this knife to the U.S. military and the idea being that um, powering the blade open through the entire stroke would allow the knife to open underwater uh, and I can attest to the fact that that does in fact work. I've opened this thing in, in underwater um, in a swimming pool already just to test it uh, and other places I've kind of demonstrated it to my friends that it'll open underwater. That was a big deal 30 years ago. Today we expect any automatic knife to open reliably and really the the basic principles that were set forward with this knife 
um, kind of set the standard for all modern autos that are being made today. So let me cut away quick. I want to show you this knife disassembled so you can see exactly uh, how it works. All right, guys, so this is going to be a quick look at the internals of a mid-1990s vintage uh, example of Paragon Knives, uh, so-called black knife. When we take the knife apart and look at the guts of it, it looks like a pretty well-made knife. Uh, the machining on the frame slash handle scales is pretty good. This is, I believe, 6061T6 aluminum black anodized. Uh, I've used this knife quite a bit over the last 20 years and I've gotten some scratches and dings on it, but overall the finish has held up very well. You can even see here where the blade pivots and rubs. It has not worn through that uh, hard anodizing. And this knife was my fidget spinner back in the 1990s. This has been deployed. The blade's been fired I, I don't know, countless thousands of times. But you can see it looks pretty good, uh, and it's held up fairly well despite some pretty rough usage. The offside is basically the same, except there's a, a pin here for alignment uh, that just slips into a recess in this handle scale, and it's sort of permanently pressed in here. Um, this milled out section here is the area where the deployment spring drops into. Uh, it's just a coil spring, much like any modern automatic knife today. Um, the rest of the parts, you've got your deployment button. Um, nicely machined, nicely finished. It's held up well. Uh, the plunger spring for that button is a stainless steel. This has been through thousands and thousands of compressions and is still in pretty nice shape. Three screws that hold the frame together. The pivot is a bit wimpy by today's standards. The screw, the threaded end here that, that threads directly into the aluminum frame is, um, I mean, it's been substantial enough. It's held up. There's no excessive wear of the pivot pin, to put, despite the fact that this knife has been fired thousands of times. Um, so obviously quality materials. The blade is purported to be uh, 440C. If that's the case, I have questions about the heat treatment on it. You can see here where the blade hits the uh, blade stop uh, post. Uh, that's gotten rather peened in over time. Um, this area, you can see an area of wear right here uh, where, the, where the plunger slides when the blade is released to come out. Um, the blade is just uneven enough, just asymmetrical enough to see that it was ground by hand um, but it's nice enough that you can see it was ground by someone who was actually skilled at grinding knife blades. I think the original blank was probably laser cut. I don't think they were doing really fine water jetting back in the 1990s. But, so that was probably laser cut. The blade looks very nice. There's a bit of a sharpening choil here. It's made from fairly heavy stock. I mean, this is a big beefy blade and it's, it's nicely manufactured. And so when you look at all of these parts uh, separated here, this looks like really quality construction. And I, I think the materials and the overall machining are quite nicely done. Uh, everything's rounded. There's no sharp edges, no hot spots when the knife is assembled. Uh, but unfortunately, as soon as you do assemble it, that's kind of when everything goes to shit. And I will show you what I'm talking about right now. So as you can see, the knife is clearly well made from quality components. Uh, at first glance, it looks very much like, you know, a top of the line modern automatic knife. And in fact, these still sell... Uh, they've been out of production for a long time. Um, 
the the original ox slash Miller black knives sell for an outright fortune, I believe. But even these Paragon copies from the mid '90s um, sell for quite a bit of money on the collector's market. This one's a little beat up. There's a few dings and scratches, and um, I've had to modify the blade a little bit, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but even in moderately used condition, these sell for uh, several hundred dollars on the collector's market. Uh, but as I said, once it's put together, the whole design kind of falls apart, at least in the execution of this knife. Um, when the blade is open, it is really a very loosey-goosey affair. The, um, the blade has quite a bit of lateral play. It's got a small amount of fore and aft play. Now, the explanation for this is this knife was designed to be used in very adverse conditions in time of uh, war. This knife was specifically designed to meet the demands of the U.S. military. And one could make the argument that these rather sloppy tolerances um, are much like the loose tolerances in a Kalashnikov rifle. Uh, they'll allow the knife to operate even when it has some sand and grit in it. I can attest to that. I've never, uh, I wasn't a Navy diver or anything like that, and I haven't taken this knife to the beach, but I have taken this knife with me uh, to do some training in the Army down at Fort Bliss, Texas, which Anybody who's been at Fort Bliss knows it's like the surface of Mars. It's nothing but red sand and grit. And I've had this thing very, very dirty, and it does operate very reliably even when it's packed with sand and grit. So um, I don't know if that's really a shortcoming, but it is a little sloppy by today's standards. The biggest problem with this knife becomes really evident when it's locked in the closed position. And the plunger, you can probably see it in there. I'll hold the blade shut. You can see the plunger that deploys the blade is quite small in diameter by modern standards. Um, I think they really hadn't worked the design out as well as they could have. You'll see uh, in the Gerber that that's much different. But um, more importantly, the cutout for the plunger in the blade, when the blade is in the closed position, is machined way too large and that allows an enormous amount of blade play when the knife is in the closed position. Um, so much so in fact that when the knife was brand new the tip of the blade right here you could actually catch your finger on that sharp tip and draw blood so I actually ended up having to um, drop this tip a little bit more than it was when it came from the factory to compensate from that. That's not really a problem. Probably the biggest problem is that the blade, um, which is uh, supposed to be 440C, when it pushes all the way in like this, or when you push it all the way in like this, it's actually stopping against the inside of the aluminum frame. The last quarter of an inch or so of the cutting edge of the knife out here towards the tip impacts the inside of the frame. I don't know if you'll be able to see. There's a bright silvery spot there. And the 6061 T6 aluminum, which is high grade aluminum of the handle uh, frame, actually dulls the last quarter inch of the blade here. And I would say that's a pretty major shortfall when the knife is actually dulling itself when it's not even being used. Um, now, when it is being used, the knife holds up pretty well. I have used this knife quite a bit. I've sharpened it quite a bit. Uh, again, it's a 440C blade. I don't really have the greatest feelings about the heat treatment of the blade. It does dull a little quickly for 440C. Um, but I've worked this knife hard out in the woods, and uh, it's certainly done the job that I needed it to do. The handle, which is quite large and uh, a bit too large for pocket carry, of, uh, actually, and it doesn't, of course, have a pocket clip. And uh, it's so large, in fact, that it's uh, rather difficult to find a pouch that this knife will fit into. But uh, despite the rather strange shape of the handle, the grooves and the excellent machining of the frame 
uh, give you a very, very nice secure grip. There's virtually no hot spots on this knife. Everything is executed beautifully. Um, the Paragon, Paragon did nice stuff. I don't know why the original company uh, kind of went out of business, but um, the knife is really well executed from a, an ergonomic standpoint. And this is a knife that you can, you can really work with all day long, even without gloves, and, uh, and not hurt your hand at all or develop any blisters. It's very nice in that uh, respect. And over the years, I've thought about trying to correct some of the deficiencies in this knife. Uh, but at this point, um, this knife is basically fully retired um, in favor of many other knives that I now own, which are, are better in execution. Uh, I wouldn't get rid of this knife. I'm going to hold on to it. I kind of look at it as a sort of tool room prototype. Um, it's sort of the modern automatic knife in its embryonic stage. And to that end, it's a keeper, but uh, I don't really use it anymore. Now, the other knife in this story represents essentially the modern state of the industry. This is, of course, the Gerber 06 Auto. Um, designed, again, specifically for the use of the U.S. military, but it was designed and developed by Gerber, which is a huge corporate division of Fiskars. Um, it started off as a very well-respected knife company in its own right and um, has been selling knives to the U.S. military for probably... 50 years at least at this point. And of course, Gerber is a huge uh, corporate juggernaut in the knife manufacturing industry with a large R&D department fully staffed by engineers. When I was a kid, Gerber was making all of their knives in the U.S. Gerber was, from a quality and engineering standpoint, uh, the most progressive manufacturer in the country, and it was really the knife company, uh, their knives were the knives to which we all aspired um, having ownership. And unfortunately, their reputation has suffered in recent years, or actually over the last couple of decades, as the vast majority of their product line is Chinese-produced, clam-packed garbage uh, meant for mass consumption and uh, sold at big box stores like uh, Walmart, for instance. But in fact, um, they've maintained their manufacturing facility in Portland, Oregon, and their products, which are still made in the USA, are really of the very highest standards, whether you're talking about a knife like this that sells for around $185, or whether you're looking at something, now this is, this is discontinued, but the Gerber Gator too. I bought this a, a couple of years ago. Very ergonomic. One of my favorite uh, bushcrafty folding knives. Uh, the Gerber Gator too. I think I paid like thirty dollars for this, and um, also of really good, unimpeachable sort of quality standards. Now this is only 420 uh, HC blade, whereas this has an S30V blade, but really built to very good, very tight, very solid standards. Um, and unfortunately, although this has sort of adversely affected Gerber's uh, reputation, all of that Chinese clam-packed garbage has uh, certainly paid the bills to allow them to develop a knife like the Gerber 06 Auto. Um, so this knife was developed specifically for the U.S. military, and it really incorporates all of the most modern design features that we expect in an auto knife, particularly one for military service uh, today. It's got a, um, a safety with a very positive uh, detent. This is a steel safety lever and uh, will hold up very well over time. It's got a much larger deploying button than, for instance, the one on this Paragon uh, for use with uh, gloved hands and to make the, the button very easy to find and deploy even under adverse conditions. Now, the safety, I think it's a nice feature, but it does require 
a certain degree of muscle memory to be developed. You have to remember to disengage the safety before you close the knife. Uh, and if you want to de deploy the knife, you've got to disengage that safety as well. Um, so that takes a little bit of playing. But one of the cool things about automatic knives is they are fun to play with. They're fun to deploy. And um, if you spend a little bit of time handling this knife, you'll quickly develop a feel for what's necessary uh, to get it to open and close correctly. You just can't forget this safety. But I do think that's a nice feature, uh, particularly since the uh, deployment button is not shrouded in any way. Uh, it, I've never had an automatic knife open in my pocket, but I've heard of it happening. And I certainly don't want to find myself in that position because you're either going to end up with a ruined pair of jeans or perhaps a hole in your leg, which wouldn't be good. Um, so the knife is made with S30V steel, as you can see here. It's got a black oxide coating. The original knife had machined aluminum uh, anodized scales, not particularly dissimilar. Uh, from those on the Paragon here. Um, the original aluminum scales had grooves very similar to this and you can see that maybe there might have been a little bit of influence in design there. Um, the original aluminum scales with these grooves have a fairly good grip. This G10 on the other hand has insanely good grip. You're not going to lose this knife uh, if your hands are wet or covered with fish slime or blood. Um, G10 is obviously better uh, than aluminum in temperature extremes. If this thing's been laying in the sun out in the desert, it's not going to raise a blister on your hand when you pick it up. Um, if you grab the knife with wet hands when it's 20 degrees below zero, your hands aren't going to freeze to the knife. So G10 is just a great, great uh, material. It's about a $10 upgrade from the aluminum to G10 and it's definitely worth it. There's also a fairly significant weight savings. I think the uh, aluminum handled version of this knife weighs just a little bit over seven ounces. Um, so as near as makes no difference, a half a pound, which is the actually the case with this one as well. This is about seven ounces. And the G10 version shaves about an ounce off of that weight. So this is just a little over six ounces, which doesn't seem like a huge savings, but to a soldier who's having to pack all of his uh, earthly possessions on his back or strapped somewhere to his gear as he's traveling on foot, every ounce makes a difference. You know, if you can shave an ounce off of 16 different pieces of equipment, you've saved a pound, and now you've got a, uh, a really significant weight saving. So. Um, the plunge lock in this knife, as you can see, over the course of years has become much larger in diameter and provides a much better locking to the blade. Uh, more surface area uh, equals a stronger lockup. I've never heard of the locking system on one of these 06 autos failing. Uh, of course, if you have, please feel free to comment down below. So you've got the large diameter button and an associated large diameter uh, locking plunger. Now when I bought this knife, I did opt for the Tanto blade, uh, partially serrated, and it was designed to fulfill the design parameters of an already existing military contract which called for a Tanto blade and a combination edge. And I decided if I was going to buy this knife, I wanted it to be as close to that which the military has been using in largest numbers. There is a drop point uh, blade version of this knife, which has a blade shape very similar to that on this Gerber Gator 2, which comes in either plain edge or uh, combination edge. But this seems to be the more prevalent design as used by the U.S. military. And I like a I like a drop point blade with lots of belly like this for doing bushcrafty stuff. But the fact is, although soldiers spend a lot of time in the field, they're not um, doing a lot of bushcrafty things. As a matter of fact, they're doing almost no bushcrafty things. They're not building campfires, so they're not processing firewood. Uh, except under the most extreme circumstances, they are not um, 
creating improvised shelters. They're not preparing their own food uh, generally. They're using them to cut cordage and webbing and fabric and plastic sheeting. Um, they're using their knife to scrape things. Um, and although I don't advocate using uh, any knife for much prying, the fact is you give a soldier a knife, I mean, most of them are not um, really knife people. They're just guys trying to get their job done. You give an 18, 19 year old guy a knife and tell him don't pry with this thing and he's gonna end up prying with it. Um, and the truth is the Tanto blade comes as close to being a sharpened pry bar as you can get. Well, actually there are blunt tipped knives with prying tips, but uh, those aren't really very well suited for military service either. Um, and this knife, you can do a limited amount of prying with it. Uh, most of these that I've seen, which are issued, have almost all of the black oxide coating worn off of them. As you can see, this one's pretty much brand new. Um, and the truth is, although I oftentimes prefer a plain edge, a serrated edge will continue to cut more aggressively than a plain edge will as it dulls. Of course, the fact that the blade is made from well heat treated S30V will help it maintain a good edge for a bit longer. Uh, I think certainly as far as a soldier's needs are concerned, a little bit of serrations can't hurt. So I think it makes a lot of sense on this knife. And I think it really is uh, right up there with any of the best, and it's somewhat less expensive. I mean, Microtex tend to run somewhere, I think, it's been a while since I shopped for them, but I think they're running somewhere in the three to $400 range. And this knife can be had for, I think, about $185, and you can find it as cheaply as about $150. So it's a significant uh, price savings, and I think it's really going to hold up well. Again, this knife will appear in future upcoming videos and anytime you see it on the channel after this, it's probably going to be significantly more beat up than it looks right now. Um, so I guess that's about it. Let's wrap this up. All right, guys. So that was a quick or maybe not so quick look at the infamous black knife, uh, originally produced by uh, Charles Ox and Ron Miller down in Florida. Uh, uh, again, the model we looked at today was made by Paragon Knives. And of course, the ubiquitous Gerber 06 Auto, which pretty much represents the standard of the industry for automatic knives today. Uh, it's certainly the United States military standard for automatic knives today. I don't know that there's an official uh, standard issue knife, but this comes about as close as anything there is. Again, this has been produced in larger numbers than maybe all other automatic knives from all the other major manufacturers combined. Certainly in much larger numbers than any individual knife produced by any other companies. Um, so I hope this video was interesting to you. If it was, please consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the like button. If you hated the video, go ahead and click the dislike button. Um, it's always valuable for me to receive feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and if you're already a subscriber, consider clicking the little bell icon down below to receive notifications from YouTube when I post new content to the channel. When I do that, I hope to see each of you here at that time. Later, guys.